So hi everyone, this is Peter, my name is Adam, we are from Red Hat and we are working on a project called Fedora Modularity. By the way, we have stickers for you, so if you come here after the talk, you can get one or two. Only 25 of them. Yeah, only 25, but that's fine. So I'm not sure who of you was on Langmuir's talk last year here in Fosdem. He was talking about how distributions are great, but not really, and how we might need to change them to to be ready for the future. So let's start with why, are, why they are great, because I think that's still true. They ship package software, which means it's pretty easy to install. They also ship dependencies and everything else with it, so it just works. They're integrated and tested, so nothing breaks really. And some important thing, it's also patched for security vulnerabilities, because for example, if you are a developer and you're developing your application, which is included in a distribution, you might not have pretty much time to patch for some security holes, so distributions can do it for you. And distros have a lifespan, which basically means they're released at some point, die at some point. This is, for example, Fedora. And if, we have, if you have a look at a bit more detail, we can see that I have, for example, distribution version 1. It includes some libraries and software, which is pretty much frozen for the whole lifetime. And then I have another distribution, uh, another version, and the same story there. This is fine, but there are some problems, because, for example, applications are uh, released at their own pace, independent of distributions, and they can also come in multiple versions, which means conflicts, right? Distributions often include only one version of every application because they got dependencies, they can conflict with each other, and it will be impossible to install. So we need to choose a version, but how to choose the right one? That's a tricky question. Because, for example, if you are a developer, you might prefer this one, fast and latest, because that's what developers want. But if you're a sysadmin, for example, you're running an application, you don't want it to change so much, right? So you might prefer the other scenario. So I guess the right answer, we need all of them. We can't just choose one. But how to do it? Uh, well, there are several, several solutions to this. So for example, we can have distribution on a fast track and another one, <coughs> which is a bit slower. So for example, this can be Fedora, this can be CentOS, or Ubuntu, Ubuntu LTS. If I'm a bit more crazy, maybe, I can have continuous upgrade. But this still doesn't allow me to mix and match versions as I want. So another solution are software collections. How many of you heard about software collections? All right, so that's like half. So software collections are kind of special packages which install software in a separate space. So I can install like more versions of the software on the system. But it's pretty hacky. It doesn't work always. So that's a solution, but not ideal. Another thing would be Linux containers. Who, are, who of you know Linux containers? Almost everyone. That's great. So yeah, we know it's an isolated space, which looks like a system. And it's for single application. And I can run multiple containers on system. But sometimes, if I put stuff in the container, I need to look after for it. I might have problems with updates. And still, I'm building containers out of a single distribution. So if I install some different version of something, this can get conflicted as well. So that's we. That's why we are working on modularity, which kind of combines everything together. And now I have like one minute short animation with subtitles, so I won't be talking. So if you could please read. You can just read the subtitles. No. <laughs> this is a talk. I'm not supposed to be talking here.
All right, so that's basically it. So it will look like this. We will have something, some, something called base runtime, which is a tiny system with a pretty long life cycle, and another software. And the software will be like, uh, how do you call it in English? Independent, sorry, independent of the distribution, right? So as I said, based on time, this is what Peter's going to talk about, which is a small system con uh, containing software with proven ABI stability like kernel and glibc and some, some basic tools to make it boot. And the software will run as a module, and module is similar concept to Android applications or iPhone applications. So it's pretty in independent of the system, and it includes all the dependencies in itself. And as I said, modules are like applications, so it can be database, it can be Firefox, but it can be also LAMP stack or basically any group of packages. And it will look like this. So I will have packages and some metadata, and I can also have packages as an API and as a dependencies, which the difference is that if I, for example, have a Firefox module, the Firefox package will be API. Uh, this is the only package I care for, but I can have a lot of dependencies, libraries, etc., which are not guaranteed to be stable. But users won't care about this. Users care o only about the API. And modules are defined as a by module MD file, and it basically defines everything which I'll show you right now. So let's do module MD. It's kind of cut off on the top, but there's nothing important. Important is that we have some name, stream version, which is an ID of the, of the module, description, licensing, some references where is the project lives, backtracking, some optional metadata, and here is the important part. So I have dependencies. There is the base runtime, and to build it, there are build requires, which is base runtime and base runtime build. I guess Peter will tell you more about it. And these are a list of the components. So I can include packages in my module, and I can include another modules in my module, which might be useful. For example, if I have an application requiring Python, I don't have to list all the Python packages, I just list the Python module. And in the RPM world, if I have a source package, I can build multiple binary packages of it. But, hmm? oh, sorry. So in the RPM world, I have source RPM packages, which are packages containing the source code. And if I build it, I can build multiple binaries. And I don't want to probably include all the binaries. There can be devil packages and, and stuff. So I can filter them thanks to this filter. Here I can specify the RPMs API, and in the future there will be more types of API, just not just RPMs, and also something called install profile, which is interesting. It basically explains how to install the module, and I can have more ways to installing. So for example, if I have web server, I can install it as a production or as a developer with bit different configuration. So that was module MD, and module MD is, uh, modules are built in something called factory 2.0. I don't have time to talk about factory 2.0, but if you can Google, for example, or find talk recordings from DEF CON, which was like last, last week, you can find some interesting stuff about that. And yeah. And when we build them, modules are delivered as multiple artifacts, which can be RPM repo, Linux container, flat packs, OS3, ISO, whatever. And the distribution, when we put it back together, will look similar to this picture. So I have base runtime, the minimal system Peter will be talking about. And I have the modules running on the system. In this example, I have RPM packages here and container images here. And as we can see, as I say, the module contains packages and all their dependencies, right? So there are some challenges, how to deal with, for example, conflicting packages in these two scenarios. So 
That's why we use technology similar to software collections to avoid that, or we can use containers. And what should I choose, RPMs or containers? Well, I don't really care because the workflow can be pretty similar. So for example, this is pretty bad. I will just make the window, yeah, so. In Fedora, we use DNF to install software, so I can type DNF install HTTPD, which is a web server. I can configure it by editing the configuration file. I can add my index HTML, and I can use system control start HTTPD. So that's the workflow in current Fedora. This can be the workflow in the modular Fedora. And I can't say if it's container or RPM packages. It will be pretty same for both. And maybe even a few days later, I can DNF update. So the workflow will stay the same, even with modules, which is, I guess, important. So how all of this works? So we focus on the package instead of on the distro version. So for example, in Fedora, we uh, we store all the packages in dist git, which is distribution git, and each package has, simil, uh, has several branches. So for example, F24, F25, which is like Fedora 24, Fedora 25, Fedora 26. And we want to change that to reflect the package. So for example, I can have package and have branches according to the versions. So instead of building distribution versions, from the disk gate, so taking like all the branches F24 to build Fedora 25, and taking all the F25 branches to build Fedora 20, uh, sorry, for 25, I can use modules to build modules. Uh, yeah, so I can in the module MD I can specify packages I want to include in a module, and I can just mix and match whatever I want, and then I can install it on base runtime. We call it module streams, and that's that's like very end of the module. We don't call it versions because in some cases it would be true, but if I have, for example, LAMP stack, I can't say what is version of LAMP stack because I have version of database, I have version of PHP, so that's why we call it streams. And these are basically just variants of the modules. And before you install, you will be able to choose the right version, or you can just download ISO with the versions pre-selected, so the user experience will be kind of the same like with Fedora today. And you can use DNF. DNF update will work. It will keep your system up to date. So that's basically it about the modular distro, and now Peter will tell you something about the base runtime, which is the minimal system. you give me a microphone? I can give you a microphone. There you go. Okay, so how does it work? Okay. I guess I will just hold it. Okay, so as Adam mentioned, uh, the base runtime is a module that sits below all, all the other modules, all the other stacks that we have. This part is meant generational core though, so I will provide some background on what generational core is, what base runtime really is, and the difference between them. Base runtime was originally meant to be only the, the lower layer uh, of, the, of this diagram. It was meant to provide hardware abstraction layer with system tools, utilities, and shared libraries to be provided by other modules included in a stack that we wanted to call the generational core. This initiative is temporarily on hold, however, uh, because of the complexity and uh, the in introduc introduction of modularity to Fedora. Uh, we don't have all the resources and the plans and the <coughs> and the clear idea how to actually separate it, what, what components go into which module and so on. Uh, 
also because the name is quite quite long and nobody could pronounce it, nobody really understood what generational meant in this context, <coughs> uh, we decided to, to just um, broaden the definition of base runtime itself, include some of the system tools and libraries, not the, not the shared libraries layer, I will get to that. Uh, but basically, uh, when we talk about the base in Fedora 26, uh, we mean base one time, not generation core. We must, we may still revisit the idea of the generation core in the future. So, the implementation. Uh, don't don't worry about the picture. It's not really important if you can read it. Uh, yeah, it's a module like an, any other. It's defined in a module MD file. It lists all the components that we want to build as part of the base one time module. Uh, it provides a stable and minimal bootable system on bare metal machines, on virtual machines. Uh, it also defines the uh, container base image for both system, system DN spawn and Docker files, uh, just Docker. Uh, the components that we include were inspired by the LSB core set, POSIX user land, and the atomic host. Currently, we, we include 700 binary RPMs defined by roughly 170 uh, source RPMs. When installed as a container-based image for Docker, it's 82 packages and uh, takes roughly 88 mem uh, max of, of, of this space. <coughs> uh, how we actually implement it is that we have this the module I just described, <coughs> which is something we, something we want to ship, but we also have to build it somehow. So we have another module called temporarily base runtime build environment, which includes all the build dependencies of the components in base runtime. It also includes all the build dependencies of those build dependencies and all the the entire recursive the build dependency chain. Currently, it's roughly 2,800 uh, packages, which when built is roughly 6,000 6, binary RPMs. Although we will ship the base, base runtime built environment, we won't be supporting it in any way. And in the future, we hope that uh, parts of the built environment will be split into, into the applications themselves, and base runtime will build depend only on itself and the applications that provide the components needed to build it. <coughs> so. OK, yeah, yeah, I will, I will try. Uh, yeah, I know, I'm just quite speaker. <coughs> So the challenges that we face when developing based on time is that there's more than one way, one way to do it, actually. So choosing the right content is, is the biggest challenge. We decided to, to go with the, <coughs> uh, yeah, with the LSB core set and, and the atomic host set and, uh, and the POSIX user land set I mentioned in previously. But it's definitely not the, not the final list. Uh, we may or we may exclude some of those components or or add something else to the, to it. Um, keeping it as small as possible is important because we uh, minimize both the memory, the space, uh, the space footprint, as well as the attack surface. And of course, smaller set means that we can rebuild it more, uh, much more faster, and we can also test it faster. Another problem is uh, building the whole set. We started with Fedora Beta, F Fedora 25 Beta, and just hoped that to select those 3,000 packages we needed for the for the base runtime and base runtime built environment, and hoped that they would magically rebuild themselves and it would just work. That didn't work as expected. We got like 400 failed to build from source issues uh, in the in the first run. That was mostly because Perl was removed just before Fedora 25 Beta was branched. Um, many packages build require Perl, but don't explicitly state the build dependency, so they were failing, and it was mostly caused by AutoTools and AutoConf. So we fixed some of the issues and then rebased our sets to use Fedora 25 release candidate 3, which uh, and the build dependency failures, uh, the build failures dropped to 180 back then. Uh, so we created a new tracker bug, and we were reporting all the F FTBS uh, issues to, to the package maintainers. It was mostly the, <coughs> the missing build dependencies, but it was also another, uh, more poor packaging practices, for example, and the lack of CI in Fedora wasn't helping. Um, another issue was uh, the 
unresponsive maintainers. For example, when we reported those FTB uh, FS issues, we gave all the maintainers two weeks to respond, otherwise we would just fix it for them. In most cases, we had to wait the whole two weeks because there was no response whatsoever. Uh, in other cases, um, the package maintainer had a different opinion how to fix the issue, which is not always a problem, but it, it just slows down the progress. Of course, the discussion helps if, if, it's, if it has potential. Uh, another issue is that we are developing base runtime and all the modules in parallel with the traditional release. We, since we are trying to build it, we haven't actually got past that yet. <clears throat> uh, we are working with the frozen package set, and uh, Fedora is still introducing new changes in Rawhide. Uh, that includes GCC7, package conf, <clears throat> Uh, basically anything. Uh, also, when a maintainer fixes an issue, for example, when with the building the package, uh, they often rebase the package, which means new dependencies and new build failures caused by the by the rebase. That's not always helpful. <clears throat> this is a picture uh, with um, with the build dependency graph of the current base runtime self-hosting prototype. It includes those 3,000 packages and the build dependencies between them. Uh, as you can see, uh, when trying to minimize the build dependency chain, both for runtime or the self-hosting prototype, because it just takes forever to rebuild and with all those issues, it's, it's just a nightmare. <clears throat> Many of those dependencies are obsolete uh, and could be removed because they were added like years ago and nobody really cares anymore. But finding them, that's, that's the problem. I can provide SVG picture later. <clears throat> So what we plan to deliver in Fedora 26, um, the proof of concept based runtime module uh, with the first version of the API. Hopefully uh, all the packages in the API will also ship with the devil sub packages so people can actually use our API. That's not as easy as it sounds because the devil, devil sub packages often will require stuff like Perl and we don't want Perl in base runtime of course. Um, we will also ship the build, uh, build environment module, although unsupported. We will ship uh, several, uh, yeah, we will ship system and container uh, management modules such as DNF, which is not part of base runtime because it moves at a different pace. Uh, the same for Docker, for example. We will also ship, um, yeah, like a proof of concept of the selection of the, uh, the dynamic uh, dynamic languages modules, mostly for Python. Again, the same situation as with Perl. We don't want Python in the, in the base runtime, but many of our tools, including RPM build, unfortunately require it. Uh, in the long term, we would either ship like a small set of Python standard library, including a, a like a small, small Python interpreter, similar to system Python we have now, but completely disconnected from the Python 3 Fedora ships today. We will also ship Project Boltron, uh, which is a funny name for uh, Fedora 2026 server, composed entirely out of modules. Um, yeah, uh, unfortunately, Fedora 26 won't have any updates. Uh, the reason is because, uh, that body cannot handle any artifacts besides RPMs. We are working on fixing that though. And it will be made entirely by the majority working group members. The reason is, again, that we have no infrastructure for uh, and, and processes uh, to, to process, like, uh, the, for example, module submission requests and uh, changes in the package database. For Fedora 27, we hope that base runtime will be much more stable. Uh, all the API will be usable. The packages that are not meant to be a part of API will be repackaged and shipped differently, uh, so that couldn't be accessed by anybody who is not meant to be using them. Uh, the same for the dynamic languages runtimes. Uh, we hope to finish the uh, system Python and Python 3 split, for, for instance. We will support automated builds and rebuilds, so whenever you push the disk it, uh, you will you will both build the component and the whole module and all the modules that depend on it. We will ship updates. Uh, the update for body is, is in plan. Uh, and the modularity infrastructure will be open to public, so anybody will be able to submit a module and build it. 
there will be a new new release of Fedora server and more content. It doesn't have a name, the, the new release. Yet. And beyond uh, Fedora Cloud, Fedora Workstation, hopefully that will include modules like GNOME, for, for, for example. Um, Yeah, we, we hope that module releases will become our primary deliverable, and the traditional release will be still available, but uh, will be composed out of modules. So we will pre-select several modules for the users and flatten them out into a traditional release. Um, and it will be awesome. Yeah, so that's the end. We have plenty of time for, for questions, if there are any. So yeah, the question was if I, for example, have an application that depends on a library. Yeah. So how do I, how do I make it not conflicting with other libraries, right? Yeah. So as I said, uh, I can maybe switch back to my slides. So you can use containers. So the module can be installed as a container, and the container will be will have solved that already. Or if you want to install it as an RPM, we might need to repackage the libraries or the dependencies in a way that it will be installed in a separate path. Okay. So each, cont each container basically has its own private copy. Yes. yes. Yeah. So there's no way to share the share the, share this library. Um, no, not in containers. Containers are meant to contain everything in themselves. So. Okay. But just to, just to further comment on that, right? So base runtime will have some libraries that are shared amongst other things. Yeah, like the machine. Yeah. Well, and at the beginning, it's probably going to be more stuff than we would like. Um, so ultimately, we would like that shared set to be smaller, so that you can have independent versions. But at the beginning, it'll be likely fairly. Because I can imagine that if the entire system is built on the module, it could be quite expensive in terms of disk space and also maybe. RAM consumption because uh, I think that Linux kernel caches uh, the same files in RAM that can no longer be done. Right, yeah, that. Yeah, there only need to be optimizations, but yeah, that that's I guess more for the future. In the RPM world, yeah, if the, we have one library of a certain version, I think it will be just once on the system still. But yeah, in the containers, that's no choice basically. But we can still use layering. So, for example, I can have the base runtime layer. There, I can have some libraries layer, etc. And if they're the same for the same container, they will share both storage and runtime resources. Okay. Right. Um, if, if I understand correctly, the problem you're trying to solve is um, the, the problem of installing mutually incompatible uh, versions of the same package concurrently. That's not the only thing. Another is that yeah, yeah. Another problem is that we want well, not a problem. We want to offer uh, applications, not packages, and we want them to offer them an upstream-driven life cycles, not the distribution-driven life cycles. So we will we will ship the RPM repository or container, uh, depending as the as upstream releases new versions, not as we just decide to. Uh, uh, and what about um, um, different? versions, well, different instances of packages which are nominally the same version, but have been built against different dependencies for whatever reason? Uh, the question is about uh, basically the same the same package and is basically the same version, but built against different, different versions of dependencies. Uh, we will build all the variations against all the all the dependencies in the chain. So yeah, there will be a lot of artifacts available in the repositories on the servers and mirrors. But uh, the build, the install the system management tools should choose correctly which module variant to install for you. The problem is that sometimes there is no correct and incorrect. Um, well, there is because we track how we build it, so we know it. 
Okay, so the, yeah. your users have to accept your uh, mm -hmm. um, your opinion on which is correct. So yeah, maybe I'll try to answer differently. Each module will contain all the dependencies, but also the build recipe. So it will be always built at the same time. So for example, it will reference particular version of the base runtime. It will reference, or basically if there are more versions of base runtime, it will be built against both, against all of them. But in a module, I can specify all the packages by branches, for example, but when I build them, the build system will save the exact commit hashes, so it will be reproducible at all times. And yeah, okay. the module defines all the software it needs. Okay, oh, to, you can uh, say. Th this concept is still requires packages, right? In the sense that the applications are still being defined by somebody on the server side, whatever that means exactly, right? It, this isn't really meant to be exposed to end users per se except that you may have multiple versions of something available to choose from. So, but that doesn't mean that it'll be, that you can arbitrarily create your own modules locally. I mean, as a developer, you could, but the, that's not the, the concept here. The concept here is that these things are still all defined on the server side, much like the RPMs are today, um, but the, the units of measure are quite a bit bigger for the most part, so that uh, the individual things can have individual life cycles. That doesn't mean that you can't go in there and twiddle with the packages, but you know you're going to have a different kind of user experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the reason why I'm, I'm asking those those questions is because um, I mean, this very problem has been a lot of interest in, in the last uh, two or three years, um, and most people have, have uh, done uh, are, are tending towards the um, functional declarative approach um, that's used by um, systems such as Nix and Nix. Um, but you're, you're still adhering to the, the uh, imperative approach, so obviously you, you don't think, you don't agree with the other thing? Or, or that's a big move. Uh, sure. So that's a, that may be the long-term right answer, but that's a, that's a gut rewrite. Okay. And no way to distribute the existing distribution. So, you know, even, even if we were 100% sure that the next answer was the right answer, we, we can't just turn it off, right? So, you know, I, I think we're kind of walking <coughs> towards towards that direction. Yeah. Okay. So you, you consider this a, a kind of interim measure? Well, maybe. I mean, to it, supreme perfection. It, well, in the sense, like we don't, we won't know until we try it. Yeah. Right. So let's let's put it together. It's not it's disruptive, but it's not train wrecking, right? And see how it works, and then you know, and then iterate rather than make a big that all at once. questions? Yes? Uh, for the containers, do you use Docker or the system gets home for the server side? I know for the GUI, uh, it's going to be uh, but for the, for example, the web server, it's going to be Yeah. Okay, so question was, how do we run containers? Do we run them on Docker? Do we run them on systemd and spawn? And the answer is we will be using OCI containers, which will be able to run on Docker, run on RunC. And for example, if you have an OCI image, you can imagine, I, I heard a pretty nice example. For example, you can imagine PDF, which could be built by different tools but you can open it in a browser, you can open it in this reader on your phone. So the OCI image will run on multiple container engines, but <coughs> I'm not sure which which would be the default. We can do both. Sometimes. We can do both, yeah. Can you go to the factory 2.0 slide? Yeah, but I have to find it. Right. Uh, it's too far. Oh, there is it. All right, so what's the carbon footprint of Factory 2.0? <laughs> Huge. <laughs> well, as you can see, it'll be a lot of building because, yeah, when building a module, we need to build all the packages. But I hope there will be some optimization, some nice filters to <laughs> not have the carbon footprint as, as big as on this picture. Yeah. I just wanted to comment some more on container runtimes. Um, 
the container space is still a, a warfare zone. Um, so if we were declarative about any particular tech there, we would be wrong in a week, right? So um, the objective here, I think, is that we want to do kind of the OCI model, which is the open standard, um, and then use different technologies to run them depending on scenario. Like, you know, there's some of the reasons for the system D container stuff is it's because you sometimes want to run a container before something like a Docker daemon comes up. Uh, so you need to, well, well, just like everything else, we have to be kind of flexible about the container runtimes that we want to use because we're going to need different ones for different kinds of containers. Yeah, right. So do we have any more questions? All right, so I guess we can wrap up. Thanks for coming.